welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. A planetarium is a wonderful place to visit to learn about stars, constellations, and planets, the wonders of the night sky. Maybe you've even been to one at some point, perhaps on a school field trip. Well, during 2012, we're going to dedicate several of our programs where we'll visit a number of planetaria in southeast Michigan. To start off our journey, we're going to go to the Detroit Children's Museum and John Schroer. Thanks, Don. Uh, I'm at the Detroit Children's Museum and their planetarium. With me today I have Mr. Steve McKenzie, one of the, uh, the educators here at the museum that runs the planetarium. Hi there. How's it going, Steve? Good morning. I'm good. How are you, John? I'm very well. Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about the job that you and the other educator that works in the planetarium do here? Well, there are two of us here, uh, myself and David Lehner, and uh, we're two educators here at the museum. And we run the planetarium shows here. So uh, when folks come in, we do uh, a show based on the night sky. So we're looking at uh, the stars in the night sky inside this wonderful dome that you see here. All right. Do you do anything more than just the stars? We do. We have the star show. We also have a, a, a slideshow. Uh, that uh, talks a little bit about the solar system. So we run through all the planets and the other wonderful things that uh, you would find in the solar system. All right. Does the, uh, do you do more than just talk about the, the stars in the night sky show? Do you talk about any about the planets, where the moon is? We run through everything. We kind of do a, a tour around the sky. So we're looking at the stars, uh, the constellations, the shapes and patterns you see, where the planets are, if there are any planets in the nighttime sky. Uh, also, uh, where the moon is. That's a big one with the young kids here, too. So, All right. Um, besides the sky show and the one about the, uh, the solar system, I understand you do a show about uh, stories of the night sky. We do. Uh, kind of this, uh, this time of the year now, we're talking about uh, Native American uh, culture and history. So we run a, a, a show here called Sky Tellers. And what it is, basically, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a program that runs in the dome here. It's pretty much a spoken word. Uh, presentation that's given by a number of uh, kind of well famous uh, Native American people who tell stories about the sky and how things came to be in the sky. So it's pretty interesting. Well, cool. Can you tell me about this uh, this beautiful machine that's right next to us here? This wonderful thing that you see here uh, is a Spitz projector. It's an A3P model um, that uh, was developed by a man named Armand Spitz. Uh, I believe uh, he started uh, working on them in the late 40s. This particular model, I think, was came about in the later 50s. This model, and it's a uh, it's a wonderful uh, a wonderful projector that uh, shows all the stars in the night sky. And uh, uh, it's an old timer, but it sure does a wonderful job of of showing the night sky. Cool. Can you tell us about the individual parts of the machine? For example, what's this giant ball? Up so here? right here, this is the. This is kind of the sphere or the, or the dome where, where everything happens. So inside this uh, particular dome, uh, there's a small light bulb, basically. And that light bulb uh, projects out through uh, literally probably about 2,000 holes, we think, in this dome. Uh, and, the, and the light's projected out onto the dome, and uh, you see the star. So that's a star ball? Basically, yes. <laughs> All right. What about all this stuff here at the middle of the star projector? All this other uh, funny-looking stuff down here. These are analog units, w units which are basically uh, uh, show project uh, all the planets in the solar system. Uh, there's also a projector that shows uh, one for the sun uh, and one for the moon. And the moon is obviously a big hit with the younger kids when we bring the moon out in the sky. And we're able to also show uh, the moon phases here. So that's uh, kind of a neat thing to show those different phases throughout the month of the moon. Now, down here at the base of the projector, I see a couple of units here. Can you talk about that? There are a, a couple of other kind of uh, add-on projectors, if you will. And what we're able to do with a couple of these things is show uh, twilight. So we can show that progression from when the sun goes down and the light gets lower and lower. Uh, we're able to show that in the, uh, in the western sky. The other one is a, uh, is a satellite projector. So we're able to show there's a little motor that runs in there and shows a satellite kind of creeping across the sky. So that's a neat one, too. The kids like to follow that. So you can demonstrate what the International Space Station would look like when it flies over Metro Detroit. Exactly, and that's what I say. I'll put that up, and I'll run the, I'll run the satellite and not say anything, and the kids will, will look and say, I see something in the sky, and I'll say, well, that's the International Space Station, and they get a kick out of it. So, Cool. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the dome that you uh, showed the stars on? 
The, uh, well, the dome is, um, I guess it's, I don't know a lot about it. It's a, it's a cloth dome. It's about, uh, uh, about 13 and a half feet in diameter. And uh, this is where everything happens, where that light is projected out onto here. We, we, you know, we dim all the lights. It's totally dark in here when we start the show. And all those wonderful stars are projected inside this dome. Okay. What else is in here besides the star projector? Can you uh, talk about the other equipment you have? Um, well, there's our slide projector that where we show the planets, uh, uh, do our slideshow of the planets. Uh, along the walls here, if you're able to see, there are uh, many different posters and, and uh, so on uh, showing things uh, in the solar system. Uh, Galileo's here, uh, our Milky Way, um, and also on this far wall here, all the Apollo astronauts uh, we show. I love, uh, I love space stuff and astronauts, so we're showing that here. We also have a, a, a large... Uh, kind of display here, uh, talking a little bit about uh, uh, NASA Space Place, a thing for kids, and that's, uh, this is courtesy of uh, our friends at NASA, and uh, they send us some wonderful posters and things periodically, and we display them here for uh, all the public to see as well. Very good. Um, tell me, your, this particular planetarium has a challenge, and that because of your audience. Can you tell us a little bit about the audience and what challenges they present to you? Yeah, I mentioned, you know, talking about kids here, and it's, our museum is kind of geared to a younger crowd. So because of that, that makes a difference in how we present our, our Night Sky show. So depending on the age of the kids, if we have small preschool kids here, and we do have preschool groups that come through, uh, we gear the shows on a lower level to them. So we may talk about some basic shapes in the sky, the summer triangle, uh, the great square of Pegasus, and I ask the kids to what those shapes are, and then we talk about those shapes. So some very basic things in the sky, as well as some of the names of, of the uh, constellations as well. And I talked about the moon, too. They love to see the moon. So we gear it to uh, the age of, of, of the audience, basically. Very good. Now, what also I find interesting about your planetarium is the exhibits you have just outside the dome. Yes. Um, if we can go over here, this is, uh, this is kind of our, uh, our planetarium and space exploration place with all kinds of space related things so uh, we have a large case here that is kind of a, a showpiece when people come in uh, the planetarium doors and, and this is kind of the first thing that they see uh, is, our, is our big space case I like to call it so there's quite a few different things in here we have a model of um, the moon that uh, uh, it, it's, it was made by I'm not sure who it was made by but it was here when I came here so we thought we'd display the moon we have some real, uh, uh, some meteorites uh, that came from, uh, from outer space on display, some stony and some, and some um, iron meteorites, some tektites down here as well, um, as well as some very uh, interesting posters that you can get some real visual, a real visual uh, experience when you come in here. Uh, I put in some, uh, because we're a children's museum, we have uh, some toys, and everybody likes toys, so we have uh, some, uh, some models of, uh, of the shuttle, uh, rockets, some uh, kind of cool space uh, craft here. Um, Including the Enterprise, I and, see. And uh, we, we couldn't be without the, the, uh, the Star Trek, the Enterprise, as well here, too, so the kids love to see that. Uh, moving down towards the end of the case here, too, um, there's a, a mock-up model of uh, a Surveyor 6, and this is one of the... Uh, uh, unmanned spacecraft that actually uh, went and uh, landed on the surface of the moon before humans did. So it was kind of there uh, at the first to, uh, uh, you know, take some experiments and find out lots of information before we actually set foot on the moon. So we have a model of that. And, of course, in the, in the corner here, uh, one of my favorites, because I love the Apollo program, uh, is, is the Saturn V rocket that, uh, that took uh, all the astronauts uh, to the moon. So that's a favorite of mine as well. Cool. Can you tell us about all these different packages here in the bottom corner? And in the corner here, too. The kids love this, too, because they come and see this, and uh, these packages are kind of, uh, it's really astronaut food or space food. So you, as you can, you can see here, uh, there's not a lot of space uh, in, <laughs> when they go up in, in space, so things have to be packaged small, uh, freeze-dried, and, and so on. But uh, these are just some examples of some of the things that the astronauts might eat when they're in space. It includes, apparently, peanut M&Ms. And M&Ms. And believe me, lots of the kids want to get in and try to get those, but um, they can't get at them. So. <laughs> All right. If we step down a little farther here, 
All right, Steve, can you tell us about uh, what's in this display case? In this case here, we have uh, some examples of uh, kind of some, uh, some earlier uh, astronomical tools, if you will, that, uh, uh, that astronomers and, and explorers uh, used to uh, uh, find things in the sky uh, to navigate uh, as well. So there's some examples of things here, what's this big as well as a, uh, a gift from a, 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 a someone here to a telescope. So we have a little Mead telescope in there that I thought kind of it looked nice in the in the case too as a showpiece. Uh, as well, part way down, um, in keeping with our with our moon stuff too, uh, a model of the Apollo uh, 11 lunar module, the first uh, that uh, put the first uh, humans on the uh, on the moon on the surface of the moon. So. Kind of an interesting case, uh, historically speaking. And I see down at the bottom over here to the left, it looks like a sundial. And, right? and a couple of sundials on the bottom as well. Yeah, uh, as you know, that's the early ways to tell uh, the telling time. So uh, we have some examples of a couple of different kinds of uh, uh, sundials on the bottom, too. All right. Now, next to that case, I see this real large globe. Can you tell us something about that? Um, this is a, it's a globe, and basically it's a globe showing uh, uh, the moon. It's, uh, we always see ones of the Earth. Uh, this happens to be a globe of the moon showing uh, uh, the dark side that we don't see, as well as uh, there are our near side and uh, all the craters and, and so on, things that you find on the moon. But uh, it, it's all there, a nice close-up visual that, uh, that people can look at as well. Now, besides the space case, the biggest thing I can see here is this giant display with some familiar-looking... Figurine. Yes, this uh, we were very excited about this. Uh, it came uh, uh, we came by it by a, a gentleman who lives uh, north of here in Linden, Michigan, and uh, he, along with his sons, uh, started collecting uh, all kinds of Star Wars memorabilia. And these cases that you see along the wall here uh, were at one time uh, in this gentleman's basement. And our curator Don Bogart, um, uh, through some contacts, got a hold of this man and asked if he would. Uh, be interested in donating this uh, exhibit to the museum, and he said yes, and uh, and and here it is. And we thought, what a you know a better place to display uh, Star Wars stuff than in our planetarium. So uh, what you see here in these four cases are some examples of uh, pretty much um, the scenes from all actually I think all six episodes, Star Wars episodes, are re represented in, in in some form here in these cases, and they're absolutely beautiful. And I'll tell you, we sure get a lot of uh, little ones and big uh, people as well who love Star Wars to, to come and look at it here. So it's, uh, it's quite an attraction for us. Well, Steve, thank you very much for letting us visit your wonderful facility here at the Detroit Children's Museum. Thank you very much, sir. Oh, well, thank you. I'm glad you came. Thank you. Back to you, Don. Thanks, John. And to our host at the Detroit Children's Museum, Steve McKenzie. If you have a question that you'd like to ask us, you can send us an email. You can see that email address down at the bottom of your screen. And right after term of the month, we'll continue with part two, planetariums in southeast Michigan. Don't go away. The term of the month for January 2012 is protoplanetary disk. A protoplanetary disk is what you need in order to form a star with planets orbiting it. Now, a protoplanetary disk is formed from a large cloud of gas and dust. And astronomers, if you ask an astronomer, they'll call this a nebula. The nearest nebula is M42 in Orion. It's about 1,300 light years away. And in this nebula, about 700 stars, young stars, have been uh, photographed in various stages of formation. The nebula is very, is not very dense. If you were inside it, you couldn't even see it. But it's huge. It's absolutely huge. And even though there's not much in it, in total, there's enough stuff to form hundreds of thousands of stars like the sun. Now, in order for the protoplanetary disk to form, the nebula has to collapse. Now, it has a lot of mass, and so the gravity is pulling it together, but there's a little bit of pressure in the gas that, generally speaking, keeps it apart. So you need a kick to get it to collapse. And one of the most common ways of that happening is a shock. Now, there are three ways that you can shock a nebula. You can have a star explode nearby 
in a supernova. You can have jets from a nearby star, uh, from the poles of a nearby star, uh, push the gas. And you can also have a star traveling through the gas and dust, and it'll have a bow shock form permanently in front of it. In this last image, there are five young stars surrounded by uh, dust and gas, and four are lit up. One doesn't have a, a bright nearby star to show it it's black. About 150 protoplanetary disks like these have been found. And, and when they collapse, it heats up from gravity. And if it gets hot enough, then the star ignites, and material that is orbiting around the star then uh, can form planets, you know, first um, planetesimals, then planets. And this is going on in the Orion Nebula. The term of the month for January is protoplanetary disk. Welcome back. For the next stop on our tour of planetaria in southeast Michigan, we're going to head down to Ypsilanti, where we'll tour the brand new planetarium at Eastern Michigan University. Joining us will be Norb Bantz along with our own John Schroer. Well, welcome to the Eastern Michigan University Planetarium. With me, we have Professor Norb Vance, who is the director of the planetarium. Thanks for having us here, Norb. You're welcome. Can you tell us a little bit about the theater and the technology that uh, makes it possible? It's a 37-seat uh, student center, actually, because we hold our astronomy classes in this room, uh, both our introductory and observational astronomy classes, and uh, new for the winter term will be a planetarium science class. And at the core of the sear where you're standing is a digitalis education solutions digitarium epsilon it's a, a full dome single lens uh, projector system capable of uh, doing full dome movies and uh, running uh, essentially a, a version of uh, stellarium called nightshade that's the one specifically designed for uh, for planetarium use correct yes and it uh, has all kinds of excellent educational features which is primarily why we use it and it's also cost effective we didn't have a huge budget. All right, very good. Um, the size of the theater, uh, how big is it? Well, the sphere itself is physically 30 feet across, uh, which uh, makes uh, a scale of having the sun uh, that size compared to this, which represents the Earth. So it gives you a sense of the uh, size of the sun when we tell them we're in a 30-foot sphere. Now, besides the nighttime show, um, that you might give for students in, in their classes. What else do you present in here? Uh, pretty much uh, uh, school groups, uh, uh, faculty uh, uh, kinds of groups that we have coming in. It's just a, a mix of audiences now. We're not fully set up for uh, public shows just yet, but we're working on that. And you opened uh, how long ago? In, in January. So it's primarily been an educational classroom. Very good. I also understand you're director of the Scherzer Observatory on campus as well. That is true. We've had that telescope up and running for 20 years now, and uh, the original a building and observatory opened in 1903, year that the Ford Motor Company formed and the Wright brothers flew at Kitty Hawk. So it's been around a while. We hope to go over there tonight with the group that's visiting tonight. I think we'll be joining you as well. Yes. Norm, thank you very much for letting us visit today. Thank you. We're in the archive room for the Scherzer Observatory, again here at Eastern Michigan University. Norb, can you tell us a bit about this, uh, this beautiful refractor telescope that we're standing next to? Well, of course, it's made by the famous Alvin Clark and Sons Company. Uh, this particular instrument, a four-inch uh, model, uh, dates back to 1878, uh, when the citizens of Ypsilanti purchased this instrument for the then normal school, teacher college. And it was promptly borrowed by a U of M professor named James Watson and taken out west to witness a solar eclipse uh, in hopes of discovering the planet Vulcan, an object that they uh, hypothesized would uh, explain why Mercury wasn't behaving according to Newton's laws. They, of course, would need Einstein to come along uh, to uh, really explain why Mercury wasn't behaving correctly. And uh, the unique thing about this telescope is that Thomas Edison was along for the ride and uh, also happened to look and use this particular instrument. So it's uh, got a lot of neat history. And along with uh, the Alvin Clark, we have some other artifacts uh, in a display case here, which include a, a, a brake circuit uh, chronometer, a sidereal clock that dates back to the 1870s, uh, the original Foucault pendulum that hung in our uh, historic building, 
and a variety of other optical eyepieces, spectroscopes, and uh, so forth. Even a classroom bell, which uh, harks back to the discipline days of uh, college life, uh, say 100 years or so ago. One last artifact we note is a focus uh, knob control for the uh, original Mellish telescope that existed in the observatory, which uh, also dates back to the 18 or 1920s. Um, that telescope no longer exists because of the fire that uh, took out uh, our original observatory in 1989. So it's quite a bit of history here at the university, and we're very pleased to show that to the public when they visit. Thank you very much, Norb. Welcome back to Eastern Michigan University. Again, I have uh, Professor Norb Vance, and we're now at the Scherzer Observatory here on the campus of Eastern Michigan. Norb, uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the observatory's history, how it got started, and uh, go ahead from there. Well, originally, this uh, building we're standing in dates back to 1903, which we tell people proudly was the year that Ford Motor Company began, and the Wright brothers flew at Kitty Hawk. Uh, the observatory was sort of an addendum attached to the top of the building and it originally housed a 10-inch refractor telescope made by uh, John Mellish, who was a prolific telescope maker of his day. Uh, it was actually reported to be the first human to see craters on Mars using the Yerkes 40-inch telescope. So that telescope stood here for 60 years until it was lost in a fire in March of 1989. It was sad to see it go. Uh, a lot of interesting stories, neat uh, things to see through an old 10-inch refractor, but it had its day coming, and uh, it has subsequently been replaced by a 10-inch uh, apochromatic refractor uh, once the university decided to rebuild in uh, March of 89. So we're lucky. 50% of the building was destroyed by the fire, including the old observatory. So everything from the third floor up in this uh, historic building is essentially new, but uh, the architecture is reset to basically the way it appeared in 1903. Very good. That mean including using the same pedestal as the original scope? Um, no, there's been some modifications, changes. The old telescope sat on an I-beam and when a truck drove by in front of the building you could see the uh, images sway a little bit. We took care of that issue by putting massive structures underneath to uh, support the, uh, the telescope proper so it doesn't vibrate anymore. The new telescope is, is a new telescope. It's a 10-inch apochromatic refractor. It has a 4-inch apochromatic uh, guide scope on it. We've got solar filters, cameras, uh, CCD imagers, the, the whole works now, a whole complement of technology that the old telescope never saw. All right. Um, what kind of programs do you have here at the observatory? Strictly for students, or do you offer anything for the public? It's uh, open every clear Thursday evening for our student astronomy club, but that means the door is open for anyone that happens to be here on campus, including guests and visitors and family and friends. They want to come up and check out the sky on clear Thursday evenings during our fall and winter terms. They're more than welcome to come on up to the fourth floor. There is an elevator ride to that fourth floor, but there are steps to the last uh, uh, few feet up to the roof deck, so uh, be warned. But it is a literally a 106-year-old building, so it does have its, uh, its moments. But we'd be glad to have you here. Here we are at what's called affectionately the business end of a telescope. In this case, a 10-inch apochromatic refractor telescope. It has a focal length of uh, about 140 inches, which uh, puts us in around 13 feet as uh, the tube length goes. Uh, I'm pointing to right now uh, the focus area of the 10 inch refractor proper. We can put cameras here uh, in place of the eyepiece and use this secondary telescope that we have attached to the, the main instrument uh, as a guiding instrument or vice versa. Put cameras on the guide telescope and uh, make adjustments, tweak the uh, tracking with the main instrument. Uh, the telescope uh, it was installed 20 years ago, so it's a 20-year-old refractor, but still uh, is uh, loaded with uh, some good technology. We have a computer uh, aiming device that we can employ, but by and large, this telescope, I like to uh, keep it manual, have the students uh, push it around, get a feel for a large telescope, or what they consider large. By uh, modern observatory standards, it's relatively small. But uh, there are only two apochromatic refractors built by astrophysics in the world, uh, one in southern Germany and this one here in Ypsilanti, Michigan. So we're quite pleased to have it, and it is a uh, showpiece telescope for the public to come and view through, and we get excellent views of Jupiter, Saturn, and the other planets, and of course, the moon, which uh, just stuns people to see through a telescope. It's not bad on globular star clusters either, but uh, it is open uh, to the public on clear Thursday evenings as a matter, of course, for our uh, astro student astronomy club, and we invite the public and students alike to come up and uh, visit us.
Well, thank you for letting us stop by and see both the planetarium and the observatory. Um, thank you again. You're welcome. Anytime. Back to you, Don. I'd like to thank John Schroer and both of our hosts for bringing us this interesting program. If you'd like to get more information, please visit our website. You can see the address down there at the bottom of your screen. And right after the scroll of upcoming astronomy events in our area, we'll have What's Up? What's up in the night sky for January 2012? Well, January starts off with the first quarter moon right on January 1st. We have a full moon on January 9th. The third quarter is on January 16th. The new moon, you won't see it much, is on January 23rd. But since January started out on the first, in the first quarter moon, January 30th is also a first quarter moon. Let's take a look at the planets. Venus is the evening star in the southwest basically all month. Venus is very bright. It's the brightest thing besides the sun and the moon. Jupiter is visible most of the uh, month, but it has a conjunction with the moon it's real near the moon on the second, so it's real easy to pick out Jupiter. Mars is in Leo all month. It rises after midnight at the beginning of the month and a little after 10 p.m. Uh, as the month closes. Saturn is in Virgo, and it's near the star Spica, quite a bright star. There's a conjunction with the moon on January 16th. Mercury is a morning object, and only really for the first half of the month, really only for the first week of the month. Uh, so here it is, rising on the 4th at about 7.30 in the morning. On the, from about the 3rd to the 5th of January, we have the Quadrantids meteor shower. Now it's going to be best after midnight, on January 4th. That's the peak. That's the predicted peak. Uh, we have a first quarter moon. When the moon sets, the sky will be quite a bit darker, and you'll be able to pick out quadranted meteors. There should be about 40 per hour, and, um, and they can be really bright. So they can be really good. In the south, in the southern sky, we have Orion. The northern part of Orion has uh, the red star Betelgeuse. The southern part of Orion has uh, the belt and the sword, the three stars that come down forming the sword. And the middle star, if you call it a star, is the Orion Nebula. Check that out. It's really good in binoculars. And that's what's up in the night sky for January 2012.